Hi, it's Ray from Pro Shaper Workshop in Charlton, Massachusetts. And before I forget, please subscribe and uh, hit that little notification bell and it'll tell you every time we get a new video up. We're hopefully going to start doing at least a couple videos a week. If it's all up to Mark, we've got to make sure that Mark gets the job done. So he's got to egg me on sometimes. We're really busy all the time. So we're uh, back on the Scout Fender. Everybody's been waiting for a couple of months to get finished on the Scout Fender. We made that patch panel up here and uh, I really didn't want to put that on until we addressed this front section which was all Swiss cheese and this was a patch panel made by one of my students and Nancy uh, and her husband worked on this uh, making that patch panel and making this patch panel so this is the lower section here that it, or, uh, Nancy's husband Dave made and he did a wonderful job on on that patch panel before they left to the class, I tacked it in. I used this uh, Everlast torch with the little on-off button here, which works pretty nice. You don't have to fumble around sometimes for the, for the foot pedal. And I, I've got to actually like these little on-off buttons. They work pretty nice. So we've got some closely spaced tacks. There's a little mismatch here. And we're going to clean this up, weld this solid, and metal finish this and you'll see it all finished. Uh, this was the flexible shape pattern that was made and if everything is done right all that will line up perfectly which it seems to do so Dave did a really good job and uh, very happy with the results so let's finish this up and we'll get to the welded stage. I just been hanging around for two or three weeks since we put that patch panel on, maybe even a month, I'm not sure. Um, and a little humidity rust builds up and uh, we want to clean this all up, plus the fire scale from the, the welding. The cleaner you have your metal, this is 19 gauge steel, the cleaner you have your metal, the nicer it is to weld it. Uh, we're going to fix this little mismatch. And these tacks are, are not that strong. So what I want to do is first clean it with this wire brush. This is a knotted wire brush, so the, they generally the wires don't go flying out because they're knotted around and held in better than the other type. Uh, this will do a higher RPM. So we're going to wire brush this. We'll put our shield on, and we'll see what it looks like. So as you can see on this side, um, the tacks didn't really sink through too much. Now this is what I call peaking a little bit. It's c coming up like this. So uh, you can't really level it with a dolly underneath because you got those nuggets of the tack still there. And if you put a dolly there, it kind of uh, buggers up the metal. So we're going to put a uh, soft dolly under there to give us some resistance. And we're going to knock this down. Now, uh, everybody's always concerned about uh, the distortion that happens when you weld in a panel like this. But uh, once you master the, the process of welding and metal finishing properly, uh, you, you will always have control over the situation. So no matter what crops up here, we'll be able to deal with it. As long as you have backside access, and there's some cars that you don't have that ability to put a dolly on the back, uh, then you, you're uh, really kind of stuck. We're going to address that issue when we work on that Volkswagen convertible at some point. But right now you can see right here, this is going like this when it's supposed to be like that. So we want to knock that down. So I'm going to get one of my uh, uh, soft dollies, which has number nine shot in it. And uh, that will act as a, a good uh, force on the back side so that when I hit this to level it out uh, it won't it won't put those little beads that are on the other side uh, causing a problem and uh, it's really good to get this leveled out before we weld it all up it makes it a lot easier to deal with now if we ground those beads on the other side because those tacks are pretty fragile it's quite possible if you hammer that without after you grind those 
or you ground them first, um, this would, the, the tacks that would break and then you'd get a couple broken spots and then you, you start to lose the uh, flushness. This has got a good flush, meaning that together exactly, not one's not higher than the other. The only problem we have, and that's some of the problems you'll have when you butt weld, is that the panel will jump up like this. And when it jumps up, it's very difficult to get it back down. Uh, it, it, this is going to happen. It's either going to go up or it's going to go down. And both of those should be addressed after tacking. And then once you weld it, then uh, we'll, we'll see what we do after we weld it. So let me get that soft dolly. The nice soft dollies, we sell them in our website, proshaper.com. What did you use the pick for? I uh, needed to get that corner out a little bit, so I hit the chisel end on it. All right, so that's flowing a lot better now. And uh, this right here was kind of bodged up a little bit. Um, Dave, when he cut it, he cut the flange a little short this way, so there was a big wedge to fill in here. So I had to build it up with, with uh, rod, and so that, we're gonna do a little bit of extra grind in here. So that'll have to be planished out and ground to get that to flow nice. So that'll take a regular dolly to do. But what we're gonna do is we'll grind this little bit in the back side here first. And to do that, I use these three inch Norton grinders, grinding uh, discs, Rolock ones. This one's been worn down a bunch, but it actually works better if you take, and Mark can catch this action, I usually go about an eighth of an, a uh, quarter to an eighth of an inch off here. I just make a straight cut like that. This is a dedicated pair of uh, shears that I use just for this operation. You don't want this too long because you don't have any support then, you don't have the control. And what these edges do is actually uh, grind in a, in a much better way, little detail. And the detail we want to do is grinding those uh, weld nuggets down. And you actually get a little stroboscopic effect too. You can actually see the weld as you're grinding because you've got this little void here. It doesn't matter if it's not perfectly cut. Um, it'll be a little bit out of balance, but you won't notice it. I, I broke down, I bought one of Harbor Freight's better uh, grinders, this Chief. I think they bumped them up to about 49 bucks now, and I was a little hesitant because some of the Harbor Freight uh, right angle grinders you can get as little as $9.99. You get about a year or so out of them with heavy use. Uh, but I've been using uh, the Home Depot brand and uh, I liked them at first, but they, they seem to be failing at a pretty good rate. So I, I like the sound of this. It's a pretty nice one. I think I'm going to buy two or three of them next time I go to Harbor Freight. It's got a, got a great sound to it. I think they do the machining better on them or something. So... We'll grind this, put the helmet on. Let's 
get a few of these nuggets here. And then that flange, see if we can grind that flange. We don't have to get it perfect right now because we're gonna we got a little fill we gotta do here on that flange. And to get the inside of flange, I'm gonna tip the fender up like this. I'm gonna feel around for anything. Everything looks good, feels good. So now we're gonna do this side. I've mentioned this many times in my videos before, but sometimes you have to repeat stuff a lot before you really get it. A lot of people will take the grinder at 12 o'clock and they'll grind across like this, right across the seam. When you do that, you have, uh, what happens is the, you start grinding up in this uh, territory up in here you really want to restrict your grinding right as close as possible to right where it needs to be. And uh, the, way, the best way to do that is at a low angle. If you go at a high angle, you're going to be biting in. And I see a lot of my students, if I don't give them direction, they'll go over and they'll grind. And they go like this. And what happens is it bites in. And it makes a big scar there. So if you have a beautiful sheet metal, and now you've got this big scar in there and the only way that you're going to fix it is putting body filler in it. And every time you put body filler in it, it's a potential problem with, this, with the uh, top coats of shrinking in and the sun baking them and they finally shrink in some point. Uh, the paints are definitely better today, so uh, you can use Bondo and stuff, but um, I try to use as little possible of fillers, just heavy primer is, is really the ideal you shoot for. So these are all TIG tacks, little tiny little tacks. We're going to bring them down. We don't have to get them flush right now because we're going to be welding this and it's going to be positive. Um, we, we want it positive so we don't have any divots at all. So put the sh shield on again. And <laughs> So what you do is you, you don't have to go full blast, either go half throttle or so. And you constantly grind, feel, grind, feel. Now you can scratch the virgin metal on both sides here, but don't, don't, don't dig. Anything that makes a mark on your metal is a no-no. You don't want any deep scratches or scars or any type on your metal. Now that flange, I had it loaded up with weld in order to get that um, little missing piece filled in there. So I needed a little more light. I got the nice new Harbor Freight uh, LED light. Super powerful. It's got a magnet. I'm hooking underneath the bench here. And that gives me that nice little spot that I need right there. <laughs> All right, so now we're ready to throw some weld on this. And what we'll do to get a nice job here, we got it all clean, we got it level. We're gonna use a piece of copper clamped in behind it. And what the copper will do, you can see over here, let's get the light on it, you can see it better. The fit up here, there's a little bit of a gap. 
so it's tighter over here. This would probably fusion weld, but every time I fusion weld, they always get divots, so I always try to add rod. So we're going to add rod, um, and having this open gap here, if we have the copper in behind here, now you can see the copper. The copper is going to give us gas protection on the back side, and it will actually make the weld look a lot nicer. All right, uh, you want to get comfortable. I've got good lighting here. I'm using my Harbor Freight light. It's got a uh, nice bending over capability here, so it bent over at 90 degrees. It's right on where I need to be. I'm going to weld. This has been welded already. We're going to do those separate, but I'm going to weld from that bend over to here. We've got the copper protection in the back. And I've got the on-off button. I'm probably going to pulse this a little bit just with the on-off button. I've got a 035 welding rod, and this is 19 gauge steel, 35 thousandths or a little under one millimeter. The smaller the rod, the better. I use a 2% lanthanated 332nd inch diameter uh, tungsten. The reason for that is those 332nd tungstens, you can sharpen them really nice and they'll last a long time between grinds. All right, so here's what we have so far. We're positive here, meaning the weld is up above the surface. We haven't sunk in. If we've sunk in, that means we've got a little too much heat. I'm running at uh, 33 amps. I probably could even turn that down because I'm flicking the switch quite a bit because I'm modulating the heat with, uh, with the switch, the on-off switch here. Some of these have a nice uh, uh, adjustment here where you can adjust the amps as well. But this one is, uh, this is a cheaper version. I actually kind of like them now, though. They, they're pretty convenient. So we're all good over to here. It's super flush, mating up nice. This is where the gap was a little wide. It starts to get nice and tight over here. It'll get easier to weld here. When your gap is open, it's very easy to burn through. So you've got to modulate it by flicking that switch to, to get the heat to uh, moderate a little bit. So let's continue on. We only got about an inch and a half or so welded. And we'll get over to here and then we'll move that clamp over. We're still getting that nice little bead. This is precision butt welding with a TIG. The ideal is to get the, the weld bead as small as possible. Now you can do a fusion, and a fusion weld is amazing, but you will find that you'll get divots here and there, and then you have to go in later and fill the divots. So I prefer to use the rod, be a little positive, and then grind it down. Now, a lot of people want to use a MIG welder. You cannot do a MIG welder job as, as nice as this. You can gas weld them. The heat affected zone on a TIG, as you can see, that's about um, 7 eighths of an inch wide or so. You can even get that a little narrow. When you gas weld, you almost have an uh, inch and a half to two inch heat affected zone. There'll be very little distortion. There'll be a little bit. You always get some distortion. Gas welding works really good. I don't think you're going to get as nice an end result after you grind it. And a lot of the guys uh, that do gas weld, they call it hammer weld, where the, where the uh, weld is still really hot. They're going to be hammering it. You could do that with the TIG if you wanted to, too. Um, but um, this I just grind after. The copper will give us a really nice back condition. It'll be super clean because it's protected by the argon. Um, and as far as uh, appearance wise and clean up and everything, TIG, gas, MIG, TIG is the winner. Uh, try them all three and be objective about it and 
you know, see for yourself what you feel is the best. Uh, people are, 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 are good gas welders. They can gas weld a lot faster, and they're already laughing hysteric, hysterically how long it took to weld this in. But when you think about it, um, I might have to put um, 10 or 15 patch panels on this scout. And if I spend, you know, five hours making the patch panel and a couple hours welding it on and an hour grinding it, it's not the end of the world. I'm going to get a superb end result. I know when I prime this thing, I'm just going to have to put a little heavier primer on here. There's no Bondo filler required or anything. And my paint systems are not going to fail because I've got bad substrate. So um, I believe this is the best way to do it. I've tried MIGging. I've tried gas welding. And um, this is by far much superior. So let's continue on here. We had a little problem that uh, the sound was going out. We've got wireless mics and we're figuring that this is sending off, the on off switch is sending a radio frequency and, and it's killing the mic. We pair the mics up and uh, so we're putting aluminum foil on it. So we'll see what happens here. All right, we found out we had a problem with the sound and uh, we put aluminum foil over the switch. The switch is knocking our sound out. So I'm continuing to weld on here. And you can see this is where the, the, uh, the uh, seam was a little wider and here it's a little closer. See how nice that little bead is? Even that's with uh, adding filler rod. It's just uh, really nice. So we'll do a little bit more. It looks like my sound is going to get knocked out every time I turn the welder on. If I put the foot pedal in, I generally don't think that's going to be a problem, but I don't really, I'll continue on here. So the sound's going to go out every time I hit the, uh, the little button here. So let's do a little bit more. You can see where that joint was tight, the, this uh, weld bead is really small. The heat affected zone is even actually a little narrower now. And there's no distortion to speak of here. Um, the trick is always resting your hand a little bit. I try to use the vice grips as a little rest or you put your finger down like this. And you gotta bring the tungsten down to really close to your puddle, about a sixteenth of an inch or so. Now the, the beginner's problem is that you keep dipping that tungsten into the puddle. And if you do that, the, the, the uh, weld will wick up onto your tungsten and then it throws a brown slime over everything. So you have to grind the tungsten. I like a nice, uh, really sharp point. I do it on a regular bench grinder uh, and I go about a quarter of an inch back. This one's about 3 16 Well, it's worn a little bit too. A really sharp point gives you really good uh, pinpoint control. So we're almost across here. I think all we're going to be able to do tonight is just get it welded and in the next segment we'll uh, metal finish this out. We'll do the grind on the finish weld and, and then metal finish that out and we'll, you'll see that in the next segment. But right now we'll just continue this weld across here. And the feed with the rod is a little daubing ahead of the, of the puddle and it'll just kind of wick in. It's like a capillary action on the side of a glass how the water goes up the side of the glass. It just wicks right in. So the heat draws it in nicely.
This was the first Everlast welder I, I bought, and I've been very happy with it. It's a bare bones weld. It doesn't have pulse, but you can pulse with the with the pedal. You can pulse with the uh, the, pe the uh, switch right here. As you can see, I mean, it, it just doesn't get any better. And I think I paid 900 for this welder, and um, it's pro it can do AC too. Now, if you're doing just DC, you can get a welder. I have them in my uh, uh, Amazon store. Uh, they're only $200. So you can buy the Harbor Freight TIG welder, which also does, a uh, does AC or aluminum, and that's about $1,000 for that. I'm, on, I'm uh, going to be getting one of those, and I'll do a, uh, a nice test on it when I do get it. So let's continue on. I only got it a couple more inches here. So, all right, we take these clamps off. Let's give it a good look at what we got here. And if you did a fusion weld, yeah, you could be argued that it's even nicer, but this is about as good as you're gonna get. Um, that bead's pretty small, like a little over a sixteenth of an inch, a little wider here where the gap was. And uh, I think that's all we're gonna do tonight. My general rule of thumb when I estimate uh, how long it's going to take to do stuff is uh, a weld like this, which is about a foot long, uh, to tack it up and then continuous weld it if you're not doing a video. And we're doing the video and our mics are going out every time I hit the switch. So that took a few minutes to figure out. It's about an hour per foot to generally weld it and, and uh, get it tacked up and welded. And then uh, the grinding can take a little extra too, and then the metal finish. And so uh, it can be a couple hours to, to get this all really nice. But when it's done, it, you won't even see that weld, and, and it will look really good on the backside too. So let's look at the backside. Now we'll use that nice LED light and look at the backside weld. Now we use the copper, and we're going to clean this up with the wire brush and you can see how nice that is on the back side. Uh, there's a few little opens that's a little open right there but that's not an issue at all. Um, but there's very little grinding that has to be done on the back side now. And installment two we'll grind this and then uh, back side and front side and then we'll metal finish it and we'll use a shrinking disc and we'll check it with the gauges and everything to make sure your flow is all good and uh, it should disappear like it was a factory piece, and that's always the ideal. All right, it's Ray from Pro Shaper Workshop in Charlton, Massachusetts. I hope you enjoyed the video. Remember to please uh, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. to tell you when the new videos are up, and please give us the likes and tell all your friends. Remember, metal is clay, it's racialine.